So today I'm going to talk about 12 more things that I learned when I became a widow when my husband died. So stay tuned and watch for the list. If you're having thoughts or feelings of self-harm or suicide, please call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 800-273-8255. Hi everybody, it's Leo with One Happy Widow. I'm back with another video. We're gonna go back to kind of like the original roots of how the channel started today. Um, my first few videos were very informational, kind of list-like, and everyone seemed to enjoy that and be able to kind of relate to the things that I was talking about. And so um, when I made my first 12 things that I learned about becoming a widow, I'll go ahead and um, put the link to that original video in there. That was the video that kind of took off for us and everyone seemed to resonate with and it became pretty popular. So I decided to narrow it down to the things that affected me the most when I was a new fresh widow, maybe in that first year or so. But now that I am coming up on four years out, I've learned some other things that have changed in your life that, um, that you never would have thought about, you know, until you became a widow or a widower. And so I wanted to share 12 more things that I learned when I became a widow and after my husband died. Let us know in the comments below which one of these that you resonated with or things that you also realized. The more that I hear these comments from our subscribers and from our viewers, I realize that I'm so much more normal than I really thought because the things that I was sharing, so many people were saying, yeah, me too. Oh my gosh, I felt the same way. So it's really even helped me to understand that grieving is kind of universal. You know, we, we might show it in different ways. We might act out in different ways, but the grieving process is a human thing and it really does kind of follow a lot of the same patterns. And it made me realize that we are so much more alike than we are different, especially when it comes to matters of the heart and how we feel. Um, so let's get started and, and talk about the next 12 things that are on the list. So the first, um, the first item that I wanted to mention is that sometimes the second year is even harder than the first. And I've really started to realize this with JP, my husband now. He, um, as a matter of fact, today is the second anniversary of his late wife's death. He's having a rough day today and I know what he's going through. I understand how he's feeling and you know, he's, he, he's struggling. He made a comment even last week. He said, I don't understand why the second, you know, the second anniversary coming up is hitting me so much harder than it did the first time. And I said, yeah, that's, you know, that's normal. Um, and I can remember going through that and hearing a lot of people talk about that. So I think what happens is the first year, the first few weeks or months, you're still either in denial or you're numb or you're, you know, in a fog and not really understanding what's going on. On top of that, you're planning a funeral. You're uh, trying to figure out how to go back to work. You're trying to figure out how to live your life. And maybe you're still trying to get your kids back on track. There's so many logistics, you know, that you're, you might have to go to court. There's paperwork you have to fill out. There's legal documents you have to fill out. You have to get all these things changed. Your tax forms are different. Um, all this stuff is going on and you're, you're almost on autopilot and you're having to go through all this on top of grieving and learning how to live your life without your spouse or your partner. And I think that we concentrate so much on the business side of being widowed that we don't take the time to sit back and just think about things, you know, and maybe that's a good thing. You know, maybe we're, our hearts are being protected until a little time goes by so that we can, um, we can better handle it, you know, l later on a little bit. But so I think that year one, and also you're going through the first birthday and the first Christmas and the first Easter and the first this and the first that and the first everything without them. And then year two rolls around and you're like, well, Ooh, okay, I got through it. You keep thinking if I can just get through that first year, if I can just get through the first, you know, milestones of everything. And then that second year hits and you realize, guess what? I got through it, but now I'm fixing to have to do it all over again. And then you start realizing I'm going to have to do it every year 
and start over. And then it's kind of like, wait a minute. It's not like you just get through that first year and you're done. Like that first year is just the first year. Now you get another year and another year. And basically you're going to keep on doing it um, until you die. And so it start the reality starts to set in. And also you've been without your person for a year and now the second year's rolling in and you probably are realizing that you really really miss them because you've already been without them for a year and you start you know realizing oh my gosh like I'm never gonna see them again when I'm thinking about how to try to help people who watch the videos and who are in our Facebook group and who are subscribers I realize that I I am right along there right alongside him in his grieving process every single day so not only am I going through it he's also going through it and we're helping each other through it so it's kind of nice that way okay so for number two some of these are just going to be kind of straightforward and simple but funerals are freaking expensive okay um when my husband was really sick and he was probably days from dying the um the pastor who was going to perform his funeral service called me into his office. He's like, can I talk to you? I, I think you should go to the funeral home and arrange his funeral. And I said, well, he's still alive. You know, I thought that was so weird and so disrespectful. And I thought, who's going to go into the funeral home and say, yeah, my husband's down the street in hospice and I just want to go ahead and take care of the funeral arrangements now. I'll have a chance. Thanks. And I told him, I was like, is that appropriate? He said, yeah, it's very appropriate. And as a matter of fact, it's really smart. He advised me to do that. And I just thought it was really weird. But you know what? I went ahead and did it. And I planned his entire funeral while he was still alive. So I don't remember what the final cost was, but he even got a free uh, burial site at the military cemetery. And um, I mean, I think it was still like, pfft, I don't remember the whole bill because I just, you know, I did this when it came to money on that first year. I think it was around twelve or $14,000 or something like that. But I mean, it's expensive. And um, which is another reason why, if you're watching this video, go out and get yourself some life insurance, at least enough to cover a funeral because you do not want to put that stuff on your surviving loved ones. Um, it's just a huge expense. For number three, um, grief. We keep, I think in the beginning we think, oh, if we can just get through this, if we can just get through that, if we can just get through this, and we're just kind of biding our time, hoping that one day, um, you know, we can get through it as if there's some kind of finish line, as if there's some kind of ending to it. Well, after a while, you realize that guess what? There's no, it's, it might feel like a marathon, but it's even longer than a marathon. Like grief lasts so much longer than we expect. In fact, it lasts forever. Like we never stop grieving. We're never done. We change and we grow and we get stronger and we learn how to manage things. But guess what? The grief, it never goes away. It never stops. Like the grief is the same. The sadness is the same. Um, we just learn how to deal with it a little better over time. Grief never stops. Grief lasts forever. Um, it's not getting through it because that, that means that there's some kind of end to it and there's not. Uh, number four is that dead people get a lot of mail. <laughs> the mail must go through, the mail must go through, no matter if it rains or snows, the mail must go through. Some days, uh, Crystal, who is my husband's late wife, and Dewey, my late husband, sometimes Crystal and Dewey get more than, more mail than we get. And, um, this house was not even built when Dewey was alive. They're still trying to get him to um, apply for personal loans. At what point does somebody get the hint that, um, you know, you need to take him off of your mailing list because he's no longer alive. But we're going on four years now and I still, at least once a week, I get something that is addressed to him. You know, there's only a few things left of a reminder that he was alive and I almost feel like, well, that's one last little piece that somebody out there is sending him mail. Somebody out there still thinks he's, you know, important enough to send him a piece of mail. Just one of the, another one of those last little pieces, you know, to make the world forget about him. And so I just can't bring myself yet to take those last little pieces of mail and, you know, write on it and put deceased and then send it back. Cause I know that at some point the mail will stop coming. And so it might be aggravating, but at the same time, I don't know. It's just kind of a weird way of just hanging in there and just letting it still come. Number five, widow's brain or widow's fog. A lot of people go through this and they don't realize it. And I started going through this and um, 
and I I thought I was <laughs> I thought I was getting Alzheimer's or like getting dementia. And so basically what it is, is you start forgetting stuff, you know, like you forget everything. You forget words, you forget your, your keys, you forget where you put stuff, you forget people's birthdays, you forget what you were talking about, you forget. It's just like you're very absent-minded. I think the reason behind it is that our brain is focusing so much on grief. You know, all the things that come along with grief and all the changes that we're having to do in our lives that um, we, that it just doesn't have enough power to remember the little stuff, you know, like our keys or our whatever. But sometimes, some days when I'm having conversations, I will realize that I can't, there's a word that I'm trying to think of and I can't think of it. Like I cannot come up with the word and I know what the word is. And if I heard it and somebody said it to me, I'd be like, yeah, that's right. You know, when I'm having really stressful times, when I'm really stressed out, I have a lot of widow's fog in that in those words trying to come up with what I want to say. You're a little stressed, like you might want to just know that if you're going through that, especially in the beginning, in that first year, if you start forgetting a lot of stuff, you're probably going through widow's fog. It's frustrating and it's normal and it does get better over time. For number six, uh, I did make a video about, a whole video about this, but kids grieve differently than we do. Um, and parenting grieving kids is, is really tough, but kids grieve in a, in, on a different timeline. They might have the same feelings. Their stages of grief might be the same, but they express it in a totally different way. And I had four kids and they all express their grief in different ways. And they're still doing it, which goes back to number, whatever it was, number two or whatever on the list, that grieving never stops. Okay, so they're never gonna just stop grieving. They're never gonna get over it, but kids grieve differently. You know, their grief might come out in anger. Their grief might come out in illness disrespectful behaviors. Their grief might come out in a lot of anger, anger towards you, the surviving parent or other people. My, um, my second daughter had a lot of anger towards anybody who still had a dad, which is just about everybody that she knew because she was a teenager. She was 15 when he died because she was jealous because they still had their parents and she didn't. So anyway, kids grieve differently. And so kind of watch out for those signs. If you're looking for specifics on that, I'll post the um, link to the video above about how widowed parenting is hard and um, just some of the, you know, some of the things that I've gone through in the past four years. For number seven, um, people are uncomfortable with us. And so when you tell people that you're a widow and they didn't know before, then they just kind of clam up. Like they'll be like, oh, I'm sorry. And then sometimes the um, conversation ends. And sometimes, and a lot of times they just like try to change the subject real quick because they don't want to talk about it. Like they don't know what to say. And sometimes when they do say stuff, they say stupid things. And so we've been through that before in the first list of 12 things. Like people say stupid stuff when they're, tr and they're just trying to make us feel better. I mean, they're coming from a good place. They don't know what to say. They don't know how to act. And so sometimes they just say like whatever they've heard before or things that come to their mind. And a lot of times they're inappropriate or they're hurtful or they're just plain stupid and they don't know. It's hard. It's hard to make friends because you got single people that are single. So they don't really know what it's like to be a widow. And then you got married people that makes you a third wheel or a fifth wheel or whatever. And so they don't really want to invite you out to do stuff because you're just this single person some women this hasn't happened to me but i guess maybe there's some really hot foxes out there that are widows that um like they they can't be around their old friends anymore because their girlfriends start getting jealous and like defensive and thinking that maybe they're going to try to go after their husband you know and so they don't really want them to be around anymore because they're like hey this is my husband hands off okay keep stay away we fit into some weird category especially when we're younger and we still have kids at home or we're still working we're not like the t the typical you know older retired widow so people do not know what to do with us um, and people are uncomfortable and we just kind of have to get used to that it really sucks because you don't really know where to fit in and so a lot of times we fit in with each other. You know, we make these communities like we have because we kind of get each other. We know what to talk about and it's okay for us to talk about our dead spouses because it's, you know, that's something that we have in common. And so I think people need to just learn how to talk with us about it. You know, I think one of the best things you could do when you find out that somebody is a widow or a widower is ask, a lot of times they ask, well, how did they die? Don't do that. Ask what their name was. What was his name? And just ask about him ask about the good things so that that person can you know tell you a little bit about their life so that he can be remembered all right let's go on to number eight they there's a lot of anger there's a lot one of the feelings that you have when you lose your spouse is a lot of anger especially if there was um like a tumultuous marriage 
especially if there was a suicide, especially or there was a, a lifestyle or a behavior that maybe caused premature death that didn't have to. Like maybe they didn't eat right and it caused them to have a heart attack or they were overweight. Um, Dewey had really bad, um, here's my widow brain coming in, <laughs> really bad diabetes. Um, and he was young, you know, but he had to take oral medicine and a shot several times a day because he would not keep his diabetes in check. Now he didn't die from diabetes because I don't even think he lived old enough for that to happen. But if he had to die of cancer, I bet you his, his complications from diabetes would have, would have still caused him to have an early death. And that would have caused me a lot of anger. You think about that. And I think you focus on that because it's easier to be mad at them than it is to be sad about them gone and miss them maybe a distraction, you know, like you're mad at them so much, so it doesn't hurt so bad to miss them. It's our responsibility as their spouse to keep their memory alive and to keep their legacy going. And there's really no need to bring any, any bad uh, behaviors, any mistakes. Um, I'm not saying that it's okay for them to have done it, but once they're dead, what difference does it make? They can't, like, they can't go back and change their bad behaviors. Try to pick out the good things and the, and the good memories and then talk about those and remember those and keep that alive. And um, it's also good, I think, for the children. If you have children, um, you know, there's no sense in bashing their dead parent because we've all made mistakes and nobody wants to think that when you die that all that people left behind are going to talk about all the mistakes you made and all the shit that you did to them that hurt them. Um, let go of that anger and that resentment and just try to pick out some happy stuff and be and be grateful for those happy times that we had with that person that we loved. For number nine, um, I've heard a lot of people talk about how they feel guilty the first time they start laughing, the first time they are caught smiling. Hold on. So it's really tough, I think, for us to, the first time that we start feeling a little bit of joy, a little bit of happiness, or maybe like laugh at a joke. Um, if, if the first time that happens, we feel really guilty. And so, um, cause we're thinking, well, gosh, my husband's dead and I'm over here laughing at a joke. How dare I do that? But just know that you have a life to live and, you know, your, your spouse would not want for you to sit in your bed and cry and ruin the rest of your life. They would want you to be happy. They would want you to move forward. They would want you to find joy, find happiness, smile, laugh, get the most out of what life you have left because they can't do it. So do it for them. And just remember that smiling and laughter is okay. Um, and it is going to feel kind of weird when you first do it. It's, it's going to, you're going to feel guilty, but know that that's okay too. And that's normal. And just, you know, let yourself feel whatever you feel, feel happy, then turn around, feel guilty, then turn around, feel happy again. And just know that you're going to be on that seesaw, you know, on that pendulum of back and forth. And that's normal too. Just let it all come, but let yourself be happy. Let yourself smile. Allow that. Give yourself permission to feel happy, to smile at a, at a person and to laugh at a joke. Um, some of us go even farther and go into dark humor and that's that's like a coping mechanism mechanism for some of us is to um, you know to joke about death to joke about our our widowhood and things like that the last video that we produced last week I'll put a link right there and, you know it had some dark humor in it we did a little skit and um, it was like a you know it's supposed to be like a funny skit and where I had the, the grief police come and, and arrest me for not grieving correctly. That's not right. You're not grieving right. You're not doing it right. You know, we had a blast. We thought it was the funniest thing. Honestly, it did not resonate with a lot of our viewers. You know, we lost some subscribers over it because they didn't appreciate the, um, the dark humor. You know, they didn't appreciate us poking fun at our grief or whatever. And so, and I respect that. I'm not mad about the people who left, but it's just our way of of dealing with it. That's my way of dealing with it. And a lot of people, you know, appreciated it and thought, yep, that's, that has happened to me. That has happened to me. Sometimes I feel like if we have two choices to deal with our grief, we can either laugh about it or we can cry about it. We're going to, we cry enough. Okay. So we can allow ourselves to choose to laugh about it sometimes so that we can get through the day. All right. So number 10, 10 is that grief is not linear. So we have these stages of grief. So it depends on who you read about or what you study. There are some 
Some people say there's five stages of grief. Some say there are seven. Some say there are nine. I think I've even seen one that says 12. I, you know, it really doesn't matter how many you put in a list, but the grieving process does go through stages and it pretty much goes in order, you know, for the most part. But it doesn't mean that you're just going to go step one, step two, step three, step four, or stage. You know, you don't go like that. You're going to go up and then you're going to go down and then you're going to go up and then down again. You're going to go up and then you're going to way down and you're just going to have your moments. But over time, you know, things do start to get better. But just know that just because you have morphed into the next phase or next stage of grief does not necessarily mean you're going to stay there. You're going to dip your toes back into that anger sometimes. Like maybe you're angry for a long time and you pray about it and you go to therapy about it and you and, you, and the time goes by and eventually you're like, okay, I don't really feel all that mad about, it. you know, I'm not mad all the time. But guess what? You're still going to have some angry times. You're still going to have some angry days. You're still going to go back to that stage sometimes, but you're probably not going to stay there. And so you're going to process through those stages. So you kind of go back and forth, um, but just know that it's normal and, and we all do that. So for number 11, a lot of times we complain that people don't understand us people aren't supporting us right people are saying stupid stuff or dumb things but in order for people to know how to help us we have to teach them we have to tell them they don't know that what they said hurt our feelings unless we tell them so it doesn't mean like you know tell everybody what they're doing wrong all the time but like if there's something that we need if, the, if we really are feeling like we can't even think about cooking this week and our kids are hungry then reach out and tell somebody hey I really could use some help with some uh, you know with some meals this week is there anybody that can help me out and I know that's hard it's easy for me to say very hard for me to do I don't reach out and ask for help very much hardly ever I feel very guilty about it I don't want to be a burden to anyone and I hate asking for help but just know and i actually got this idea from uh the book that we're about to read for our next book club um so there was a little section in that book that talked about how people don't know how to support us they have no idea what we need because they haven't been through what we're going through and so they didn't know how to help me they had no idea what i needed and they felt uncomfortable like we said before in the list and so they just they said a few things in the beginning then they disappeared and that was it and then never, you know, like they don't poke back in after four years and say, hey, how are you doing, by the way? Because they think by four years, well, you should be fine. You've remarried. You know, you're, I see you smiling and laughing. You're going to work every day. You must be over it by now. You're, you should be fine by now. So you don't need my help. So you have to coach them. You have to, you have to tell them what you need. Say what you need. And people will usually give it to you. That's what they want to be told. They want to be told how they can help you because they want to help and they don't know how. So if you tell them, hey, I really could use some help with this, okay, and then everybody wins. All right, so the last thing, number 12, is that our life goals may change. So when you are married, you probably have like this list of goals that you guys want to do together. You know, you want to buy this type of house, you want to have this type of job, you want to do this thing with your kids. And so um, it's really hard to know that when your spouse dies, that you're by yourself and some of those goals first of all some of those goals you might not even be able to do anymore because you're just one person so when I was married before um, doing I wanted to get a big piece of land and um, you know live out in the country and that kind of stuff well when he died I knew that I couldn't live on a big piece of land because I didn't have, I don't know how to ride a tractor and I don't want to. I don't want to take care of a bunch of land and a bunch of acres and a bunch of, you know, property or whatever. Not only that, but I didn't want to be out in the middle of nowhere, you know, middle out of the country and not be able to run for help if something happened to me. I know that's very unlikely, but just, it just was not my goal anymore. And so I ended up moving into a house in a neighborhood. And so um, my goals changed. I was going to be a teacher at this school that I worked at and I was going to do my thing and then I was going to retire and um, and I, you know, my goals changed. I changed jobs. I went to a different place. Now my goals have changed again. Now I'm remarried. Now huh, we're getting ready to put this house up for sale in a week and we're going to go move out to the country, you know, on that piece of property that I didn't think I wanted to live on because my husband, JP, is... He, he's from the country and he, he loves taking care of property. And so he's going to be the one to take care of property. So, you know, my goals have changed more than once. My career goals have changed and my children raising goals have changed. And I'm looking at other avenues and I'm looking to change, you know, to pivot. 
in my life. And so um, just know that that's okay. It's okay for your life goals to change. You know, it's hard to accept because it's a kind of a reminder that our spouses are gone and our, our goals changed because we became widowed. But that's okay. Embrace it. Make new goals for yourself. Do things that make you happy. You know, you don't have to worry about what anybody else wants but you. Just do what you makes you happy. Make the goals that you want for yourself and go out and set out and do them and make it happen. And you've got support. You've got us. We've got a really nice support group. We have a great Facebook group. We support each other. We love on each other. We laugh together and we encourage each other to find happiness and find purpose in life. And I just really love the atmosphere of the group that we have. We connect together and we're helping each other. And it's really nice to see that. We're not just sitting around crying together and complaining about our crappy lives. We're really like lifting each other up and trying to support each other and finding happiness and making new goals for ourselves. And in this journey of, you know, life and grief and all that, it's really refreshing and nice to see that in, in our group. So I appreciate all of you guys. You know, you have to be widowed. Just be willing to support us. Be willing to support your family members that are widowed or your uh, friends. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. If you found any kind of, um, if you've resonated with any of this in the video, if you found any kind of support, any kind of help, if you got anything out of this, go ahead and subscribe. Hit that bell so you don't miss any other videos. And, um, you know, come, out, come on out, join our Facebook group and um, look for the hashtag WIDFAM. And, um, you know, let's, let's all go through this grieving process together so that we don't all feel alone in our, in our grief. So until next time, we will see you next week on the next video. Bye.